lost in the war, so he, he, was, he was interested, you know, and I kind of followed from him. I'll turn this over to Mike. Mike with the mic. Yeah. I'll, stay, I'll stay out of the light anyway. But thank you for much, thank you for joining us for our 207th Coffee and Conversation. Uh, and we obviously have a fascinating topic. I think it's also a cautionary tale how you can kind of take your reenacting to the extreme. Yeah. With, <laughs> how, you know, just, it's that first foot in, you know, in the water and it sounds great. And Bill may tell us how the heck did he ever start off with the reenacting and then ended up with how many horses? Two horses? Uh, I've, had a, I've had about six or seven. Some of them have died along the way. I only own one right now. He lives in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. I keep him there so that when I travel back, I have a horse there. I have two living with well, me. Well, okay. <laughs> but they're not mine. This will go on. This is where you lose control. <laughs> but anyway, uh, what I'd like to do is, just before we get started, is remind you of upcoming talks, which also will be quite fascinating. Uh, Teresa Smith is our next speaker on the 24th of July. And I had to reschedule Tracy. We had hoped to have her earlier. Uh, but in any event, her, her father was in charge of rebuilding Bent's Old Fort down in southwest, Ooh, southeast cool. uh, Colorado, and rebuilding it in the manner that the original construction was. So it's really quite fascinating, the story of how they went about it. We'll also highlight all the other marvelous historic sites down in that same area. We're blocking your vision. I so, uh, no, no, don't worry. Kathy's fine. Uh, okay. Doesn't matter where I So anyway, uh, so Teresa will be our, our speaker on the 24th, so put that on your schedule. <sighs> and then we, again, have two fascinating speakers for uh, August. Uh, David Barrett, who's a professional historian author, had spoken with us once before. And his talk will be on the final, let's say, six months of the war in the Pacific during World War II. What was the, what were the cal calamitous, you know, critical decisions that had to be made both by us and the Japanese of how to bring this terrible war to closure? So um, David just finished a book on that, and we'll bring copies of that with him. Uh, and I think that'll be quite fascinating. And again, it, the end of August was essentially when the war was ended. Uh, with, you know, 2nd December was the signing of the Surrender Treaty at, you know, in Tokyo Bay. And then the 28th of August, Mike Ebbing, who's going to join us. Uh, Mike was in the Army, but he had an interesting view of things because he served with the White House Communications Agency during the Nixon administration. Uh, that meant wherever President Nixon moved, his group went along with him to ensure he could communicate worldwide with both, you know, our key other decision makers in our military. Uh, and I think he even has some recordings, which uh, he may share with us. So, you know, whenever President Nixon went up to Camp David, they'd scurry up there and set up things. When he traveled overseas, he went with them for that. So both of those... I think will be quite fascinating. So again, without further ado, uh, Bill, it's all yours. Thank you. So the topic of this, and first of all, I'd like to thank you all for coming. It's no fun to sit here and talk to empty seats. Thanks, so thanks for being here. The topic we're going to talk about is the cavalry at Gettysburg. Sometimes there will be references to what Robert E. Lee and the infantry was doing just in putting into context why the cavalry was doing it. But primarily, we're talking about mounted forces on this. If uh, any of you are interested, we could do this again sometime and talk about a different aspect of it. And I would ask that if you could, hold your questions to the end. However, if I say something and I totally lose you, and you go, well, you know, what's this guy talking about? I'm lost. Raise your hand. We'll go back and we'll, you know, get you caught up because I don't want, you know, it all builds on each other. So. If you have questions, try and hold them to the end, but if you really need some help, we'll do it. How about 
Okay. I won't block the. No, no, you won't. Say when. Right there. Right there. That's. All right. So the first thing I want to say is, in terms of what we're talking about today, we're going to use the word Civil War a lot because that's what we're all used to. But I always try to start off telling people that back in those days, the term Civil War just didn't exist. Okay? They called it the war between the states, the war of secession, the war of northern aggression. At the end of the war, Congress initiated a huge investigation, kind of like the Warren Report and things like that. And if you ever see the final report, it's called the War of the Rebellion, and it's about 100 encyclopedia-type books. I saw one in Virginia once. It was on a bookshelf that would take up this whole wall from ceiling to floor. I mean, it was exhaustive. So that was the official name. It's the War of the Rebellion. But for our terms and what we're used to, I'll probably call it the Civil War. I just want you to know that you know, normally I do this in a first person uh, presentation at the reenactment, so there's no computers, no electricity, and there we try to keep it, you know, in modern, in Civil War terms. So the purpose of cavalry, okay? Both armies had cavalry. At the beginning of the war, most of the federal cavalry was at the frontier, so they had to raise a lot of additional cavalry. The uh, Southerners, we'll talk about that a little bit. But the purpose of it is mostly to gather intelligence. They're the eyes and ears of the Army. And prevent the enemy from gathering intelligence on you. The term is screening. They gather supplies for your Army and destroy supplies and communications for the other side. That's raiding. And then once the Army is in retreat, the cavalry goes after them. That's a good time to... You know, when they're running away, you know, put the cavalry on them because they can catch up and do them some damage. There were differences between the Union and the Confederate cavalry. As I mentioned, the, uh, most of the, you know, the small army that was at the beginning of the war was out west, and they brought some of those guys back, but they needed to raise a lot of extra cavalry. And what they would do is they'd get a bunch of, you know, guys that volunteered, and they'd go one, two, three, four, cavalry. One, two, three, four, cavalry. So a lot of the Union cavalry were city boys. And a lot of these guys, you know, in New York and Philadelphia, they had public transportation systems. A lot of these guys never even saw a horse at that time. As opposed to the Southerners, there was four times as many miles of railroad in the north than there were in the South. The South was very rural and agrarian. The railroads were you know, nowhere near in competition with the Northern railroads. So everybody relied upon horses to get around, carriages. And most people, the ladies, all rode horses and stuff. So at the beginning of the war, you've got Northern boys that aren't familiar with horses. And you've got Southern boys that have grown up and trained these horses and been riding since they were kids. So there was a great advantage to the Southerners because they were used to hunting and fishing and riding horses, so they were familiar with guns and horses, not so much in the North. It was said that it took almost two years to train a cavalryman and a horse to work together. And as we go on, you'll see exactly where that comes to fruition. But there was a, a, a difference there. The other big difference was is that the Union Army provided horses to cavalry. If you wanted to be in the cavalry in the Southern Army, you brought your horse to the war, and you were paid per day, per diem, for the use of the horse. If he was killed in battle, you were paid for the loss of a horse. If he was stolen or ran off or you lost him, that's your tough luck. Okay, so that was basically you know, some of the big differences. And then, of course, the difference in the, in the weaponry that were used by the two armies. Mostly the Union Army was issued a saber. This is the 1860 light cavalry saber. Before they adopted this, they had a heavier <clears throat> saber called the 1842. Some of you might be familiar with the term the wrist breaker. They were heavy, and sometimes when you swung them, they actually injured your wrist. So they adopted this in 1860. 
And then most of the Union cavalry was issued some sort of a carbine. This is a paper cutter sharps. It's called a paper cutter because the bullet was a paper cartridge you put in there. And as you brought the lever up, the breech block cut the back of the paper off to expose the powder. And some of the, uh, the Union troops had Spencer carbines. I've brought some books up here. There were a million different kinds of guns. But generally, the Union had Spencers and, and paper cutters. <clears throat> The Confederates had whatever they brought to the war with them. Sometimes it was Grandpa's shotgun or the Kentucky long rifle or whatever they had. So there was a huge number of weapons on the Confederate side. During the Pierce administration, Jefferson Davis was the Secretary of War, and he was from Mississippi. And he could see the tensions growing between the North and South and anticipated a conflict coming. So he transferred a lot of federal ordnance to southern arsenals. And when the war started, the southerners took over all the Union forts in the south except four and confiscated all the weapons. So some of the weapons that the Confederates got were Union weapons, albeit sometimes they were a little bit old and obsolete, but they got a lot of their weaponry that way. And then they used, you know, the southerners used pistols, all different kinds, primarily the Union Army was given Colt pistols, revolvers, six-shot revolvers. This is an Army, an 1860 Army Colt, 44 caliber. There were also some 1851 Navy Colts, 32 caliber. But those were primarily the Union weapons. The Confederates had anything they could find. And then as time went on, as they would win a battle and they'd find weapons on the field, they would, you know, take those and, you know, replace the more obsolete weapons with more modern weapons. Some of the original uh, cavalry units even came out with spears, pikes, but those were somewhat you know, useless against rifles. So there's some books up here if you'd like to see them later and you could take a look at some of the stuff. So let's talk about the antagonists in the cavalry. On the left side, you have the cavalry corps. Army of the Potomac, commanded by Major General Alfred Pleasanton. And his corps was divided into three divisions and a horse artillery division. The difference between regular artillery and horse artillery is horse artillery, everybody's mounted. Infantry artillery, half the guys are walking. But they're all mounted in horse artillery so that they can keep up with the cavalry. And they were divided into three divisions. On the right side, you see the cavalry division of the Army of Northern Virginia by, commanded by Major General Jeb Stuart. And his men were divided into seven different brigades. Okay. Now, the red ones, Hampton, Fitz Lee, and Rooney Lee's brigade, were about 60% of Stuart's cavalry. And those are the guys that went with him when he went around the Union Army on the way to Gettysburg. The two brigades in blue were the guys that were left behind to guard the passes in the Blue Ridge Mountains. The Green Brigade actually went with the infantry, General Ewell. He was the first man to march north on the Gettysburg Campaign. And it wasn't called the Gettysburg Campaign. But he went with Ewell as sort of his advance guard. And then there was the horse artillery and an independent command under John M. Bowden. He was from the way western part of Virginia and brought in for this 1863 campaign. We'll talk some more about those a little bit later. That's Alfred Pleasanton. He was a West Pointer, graduated in 1844, one of the most important brigade commanders was John Buford, West Point of 1848. That's Jeb Stuart commanding the Confederate Cavalry, West Point, 1854. And one of the things that I brought out in this thing, you'll notice if I went through all the different commanders, they're almost all West Pointers. These guys all knew each other on both sides. I mean, there's stories of them actually fraternizing. We'll pick that up at some other time. So anyway, in the summer of 1863, Robert E. Lee's objective 
was to move the war out of Virginia. For the first two years of the war, you know, the war was mostly fought in the Eastern Theater between Washington, D.C. and Richmond, which are 90 miles apart. The armies were back and forth and back and forth. So by this time, in 1863, I mean, you could walk from, from Washington to Richmond and you'd find that the, the ground was bare. I mean, it was, you know, it was, nothing was growing because both armies had been over it repeatedly. And so now, Robert E. Lee was hoping to get both armies north of the Potomac. He figured if I go north, the Union Army will have to come. And then it'll be the farms from Maryland and Pennsylvania that are feeding the armies and give Virginia a rest. He also figured that a successful campaign north of the Potomac River could affect the sentiment of the northern people. You know, if they get beat up in the north, they might say, hey, you know, let's let them go. I mean, the South never wanted to conquer the North. They just wanted to quit and start their own country. So Lee hoped that maybe they'd just say, hey, you know what, they're a pain in the butt, let them go. And also he thought a victory on northern soil could cause foreign governments, England, France, which England had already banned slavery, probably wasn't going to happen. But he thought, you know, they might recognize the Confederacy as a legitimate government. Lee attempted the same thing in the fall of 1862. After the second Manassas campaign, he crossed the Potomac, went into Maryland with these exact same thoughts in mind. However, there was a story about an order to one of his subordinates that was lost. The Federal Army found it. Within a couple hours, George McClellan had Lee's plans written out in his hands which forced Lee to concentrate at Sharpsburg, Maryland, fight the Battle of Antietam, and consequently had to retreat back to Virginia. And so his designs in feeding the army in the north in the fall of 1862 were thwarted. Now it's the summer of 1863. It's still on his mind. So in the summer of 1863, Robert Lee gathered all of his forces. And there was a map coming up. There were some of them were at Fredericksburg. A lot of them were around Culpeper. A number of them were out west of the mountains in the Shenandoah Valley. And while I'm speaking of it, we're going to talk about Virginia in two aspects. West of the Blue Ridge Mountains, between the Blue Ridge and the Alleghenies is the Shenandoah Valley. If you hear me talk about the valley, that's what I'm talking about east of the Blue Ridge Mountains, it's the Piedmont. It's a much flatter, more uh, suited to agricultural. If you hear me speak of the Piedmont, we're talking east of the Blue Ridge Mountains all the way to the Chesapeake Bay. So there were some of the forces that were spread around in the Shenandoah Valley. In the spring of or the summer of 1863, he gathered all these forces. He even brought some up from North Carolina so that he could gather this army for his march north on the invasion of the North. The Southern Cavalry troops, when this happened, concentrated at a place near Culpeper, at a place, a stop on the Orange and Alexandria Railroad called Brandy Station. And when all the troops came up from North Carolina and in from the Shenandoah Valley, Stewart had 10,000 troops. It was the largest body of troops he ever had under his command. And when he did, he, was, he thought that they were the finest cavalry in the world. At this point, the Southern Cavalry had been running circles around the Union Cavalry because they were still learning to ride their horses. They were still learning a lot of the things that you need to do to be a cavalryman, where the Southern boys adapted to it better because they were all horsemen. So he held his grand review at Brandy Station, had his 10,000 troops pass in review, invited a bunch of dignitaries and people to come and see. He was kind of proud of his cavalry, and he was bragging of them. Of them. Uh, they finished this review with a mock saber charge, and four days later, the Union cavalry crossed the Rappahannock River. At the time, if you look at Virginia, the Rappahannock River comes from the Blue Ridge Mountains, sort of from the northwest. The Rapidan comes from the southwest. They come together and flow to the Chesapeake. That area between the Rappahannock and the Rapidan, there's a sort of a triangular area. It's called the Little Forks area of Virginia. You're probably familiar with it. And that's where Ro Culpeper and Robert E. Lee's army was mainly camped. The Union Army, 
was on the other side of the Rappahannock River. You'll see that on the next map coming up here. But anyway, this large gathering of, of troopers gathered some attention. The Union Army thought, wow, what's going on? You know, a lot of Confederates, you know, there. And so they decided Albert Pleasanton was ordered to take his cavalry, cross the Rappahannock River, cross the two fords, Beverly's, and um, I'll think of it in a minute, and crossed with two divisions and attacked Stuart on the morning of June 9th. Sort of caught him by surprise. He caught a lot of criticism on this because he was somewhat surprised. In his defense, I'd always say that at, to this point, the Federal Cavalry had never shown such boldness. But now, the war started in 61, it's the summer of 63. Two years have passed, the Union Cavalry has learned to both ride and fight. And they made a, a, a fight at Brandy Station between 20,000 mounted guys. The Union Army brought two brigades of infantry to guard the fords so that if they had to retreat back across the river, the Union stayed there and made sure those fords were available to them. But there were about 20,000 men that fought all day on the fields of Brandy Station. If you go there today, it's still a big open field. I mean, they, it hasn't been developed. I don't know how long that'll happen. A lot of it belongs to the Brandy Station Foundation, so it's protected. <clears throat> anyway, at the end of the day, the federal troops withdrew. They went back across the river, but there was great embarrassment to Stuart, and it disrupted his plans because he was originally supposed to start moving north the very next day. And because of it, because of this battle at Brandy Station, he had to care for his wounded, and all his men had been supplied with ammunition and food for the march north. Well, the ammunition got used up at the battle, so he had to reissue ammunition, he had to replace horses that were killed, he had to take care of the wounded, and that delayed his movement for several days. General Ewell was the very first man to move north. What you see here is a map of that northern Virginia and southern Maryland and southern Pennsylvania area. And I drew in right there. This whole thing is the Blue Ridge Mountains. So this is the Shenandoah Valley. This is the Piedmont area of Virginia. At the time of this Battle of Brandy Station, which is right there, and Culpeper is right there, that's the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. And most of the Union Army was on this side of the Rappahannock River. You see it running right there. And most of the southern side was on the south side of the river. That was dividing. I mean, the Rappahannock is a substantial river. You will not walk across it without getting your feet wet. Anyway, Kelly's Ford was the other one I was trying to think of. Um, so they crossed the river. They fought there all day. And when the movement was planned, I'm sorry. Um, when the movement was planned, the infantry was marching over the mountains into the valley, and they were going to move north. Stuart and the cavalry's job was to stay on this side of the mountain. If you see Aldi, Middleburg, Upperville, and just beyond that, there's a little town of Paris. Paris is at the very top of the mountain. Stuart's job was to keep the Federal Army from going up that road. It was called the Little River Turnpike. Today, it's modern Route 50. Still there, you can still drive it. It's a great drive. But his job was to keep the Federal Army from getting up to the top of these mountains and looking down into the valley where he could see about 70,000 Confederates marching north. Robert E. Lee was trying to sneak up north without the Federal Army knowing it. Now, the year before, when I mentioned uh, and the uh, Antietam campaign and the Second Manassas campaign, one of the things that happened is Stonewall Jackson marched around John Pope's army, which was camped along the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. He marched out west, marched between Pope and Washington, and hit the thing at what would they call Fairfax Station and Manassas Junction, hit the railroad there. So suddenly, Lincoln was very alarmed because the rebel army was closer to Washington than John Pope's army was. They were 
on the other side of the rebel army, and that was very scary to Lincoln. Consequently, Lincoln gave all of his future commanders explicit orders that you will never let the rebel army get closer to Washington than you are, okay? You must keep yourself in front of Washington to protect the city against the rebel armies. So in the summer of 1863, the, the U.S. Army was camped in five corps, and they were up in this area of Leesburg all the way in here in sort of a semicircle, protecting, because they knew from what they had seen here that the rebel army was out here somewhere, but they didn't know where. But, so they were camped in front of Washington to protect it. A scout for Stuart named John Singleton Mosby came in and said, Federal Army is all camped. They're miles apart. They're in camp. You could easily sneak between them at night and move you know, past them and get in their rear. So after the fighting, here, okay, Robert E. Lee's army had already moved north, and one of the things that happened is there were three corps. Richard Ewell went first, he's up here. A.P. Hill second, he's in this area. Longstreet is the, the last corps to move up, he's in the end of the vanguard. Well, after this happened, Longstreet crossed the river at Williamsport, and when he did, the federal garrison at Harper's Ferry looked down the river and could see a large body of Confederates crossing the river. They already knew that some Confederates were up in this area, Ewell. They were getting reports of Confederates up in Pennsylvania, but now they see another large body crossing the river, and so to keep themselves between the rebel army and Washington, they had to get on the other side of the river. Because if the rebel army was there, then they could just come on the other side of the river if the Union army was still down here. So that put them in motion. The next thing you hear is these are the exact orders that were written to General Stuart by General Lee. And it basically, if you read the whole thing, I won't read it to you, it's very vague. Robert E. Lee had a style of command that he didn't very often tell you to do anything exactly. He made suggestions. That was his style. He was a gentleman. But the part I highlighted in red, it says, you will, however, be able to judge whether you can pass around their army without hindrance, doing them all the damage you can, and cross the river east of the mountain. So his job was to collect supplies and damage their army and gave Stuart a large amount of discretionary choices in doing this. So Stuart was going to move north. He could do it in two ways. He could take and cross, he could cross back over the mountains and cross the river up here where the rest of the army did, or he could cross the river here east of the mountains. When they first started to move, Nobody ever said we're going to Gettysburg, okay? Gettysburg was never even mentioned. The object of the movement was Harrisburg, Pennsylvania and the Susquehanna River. Harrisburg is the capital of Pennsylvania. And if you look at these mountains on an actual map, they curve like this. And so this avenue, the valley, basically re leads you right there. You know, you could follow the valley almost all the way to Parisburg. And Stuart's original orders were to cross the river and meet up with Ewell and take position on his right. Okay? So he could go west of the mountains or east of the mountains. He chose to go east of the mountains because if he went to the west of the mountains, he would be trying to use roads that the infantry was already on. And in those days, roads aren't like we have today. You know, they're small and less of them. So the problem is, is the cavalry would be on the road behind the infantry, which moves at the rate of infantry. And if you want to get ahead of them, you'd have to go off of the road, you know, go through ditches, try and cross rivers with no bridges. You know, very difficult, slow you way down, way down. So Stuart figured that if I crossed to the east of the mountains, 
all right? I could head towards Washington, and because he had done several dramatic raids in the past, he might put the fear into the Federal Army that he was making a run at Washington and hope to draw the Federal Cavalry after him, <laughs> thus keeping Robert E. Lee and his wagon trains safe out in the Shenandoah Valley. Draw him away. So when he did this, his original plan, they started at Salem, OK? And they ended up planning to use what was called the Old Carolina Road. It went all the way from the Carolinas to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. All right, he was going to cross just to the east of the mountains and head up right like that. Well, when Longstreet crossed the river, put the Federal Army in motion, instead of being in camp, they're now on the road. Stuart gets to the Old Carolina Road, and Hancock's Second Corps is on the road. In those days, infantry marched four abreast. A corps was about 10,000 men, roughly, and all their wagons, supplies, artillery, medical, everything, a corps would take up about 20 miles of road. So Stuart couldn't use that road. When he first saw them, he deployed a couple of cannons. He shelled them. That caused Hancock to have to go from a marching formation four abreast, where they have to turn and get in a battle line. You can't shoot from, if you're the 50th row back in a four abreast, you know, you'd shoot your own guys. So you have to get in a, a line like this to fight. And that takes time to deploy in that manner. And so Stuart basically shelled them, caused them to go into a battle formation, and then withdrew. You know, just said, all right, you know, I'm not going to try and fight an infantry corps with my 6,000 cavalrymen. So as they marched on, Stuart was forced to come farther south. This dotted line is Stuart's route. Okay? The red line is the infantry. The blue line is the movement of the Federals. And the dotted line is Stuart's march up there. So he goes around the end of Hancock's uh, corps that's marching, hits the railroad, comes up, crosses the river up here at Rouser's Ford, and then moves on to Rockville, Maryland. And when he gets to Rockville, Maryland, let's see here. When he gets to Rockville, Maryland, he runs into 150 brand new federal wagons that are bound for supplies for the Army of the Potomac. And he decides to take them. I mean, this is a very pr tempting prize. Part of his orders that I think maybe you read earlier that I skipped over was to gather supplies. These wagons were full of ammunition, food, medical supplies, everything that an army needed. He attacked this 150 wagon train, lost 25 of them either through wreckage or escape, but actually captured 125 brand new wagons, fresh mule teams, full of supplies. But he now has to take and drag this 125 wagon column along with him, which greatly slows down his movement. So he moves on from. Uh, that always happens. Yeah. <laughs> he moves on from Rockville and moves north. And when he gets to Westminster, he runs into the first Delaware Union Cavalry and has to fight them to protect these wagon trains. This causes him a little more delay. Eventually, he moves up. And when he gets to York, he starts looking for Ewell. That's his, where he's supposed to be. And earlier, some of John Gordon's infantry had marched through Gettysburg and had come out. They were thinking about trying to take the bridge on the Susquehanna River, but never did make it there. They were recalled. But Stuart's scouts at York found out that there were Confederates in this area, so he sent men to go look for them. And he moved on to Carlisle. Carlisle is a Union barracks. And he, in turn, shelled it and burned it. And in the meantime, the scouts come back and said, General Lee is engaged in a battle at Gettysburg. You are to go there. So he traveled from, Gettys from Carlisle down to Gettysburg. <clears throat> 
And he arose on the second day of the battle. Previously, John Buford, the Union Army, had come up from the south. The interesting thing about the battle is the Confederates came from the west, and because Ewell was up at Carlisle, came from the north, and the Union Army came from the south. And when Buford came up, he spotted rebel infantry marching along towards Gettysburg. And if you look at this town of Gettysburg, you'll notice that there are a lot of roads that all come together. You know, they come through this area, and so it's a hub. And he decided that, you know, this is an important thing for me to secure. So he took and put his first brigade out here, and that's where the Battle of Gettysburg started, between Buford's uh, first brigade under William Gamble and A.P. Hill's corps marching in from Cashtown in the west. And they fought on a place called McPherson's Ridge. Eventually, Ewell came down from the north when Buford's 2nd Brigade arrived under Devon, Thomas Devon, they formed a right angle. So you had the Union Army in a position like this to confront Ewell coming from Carlisle, that area. And eventually, the 1st Infantry Corps from the United States Army came up under John Reynolds and relieved the cavalry and continued the battle to, to continue, continued the fight. So there's sort of a picture of Buford and his men standing off the Confederate infantry. A battle between a brigade of cavalry and a corps of infantry is a very uneven match. I mean, it's, the infantry is the power. You know, they've got artillery, they've got men that are you know, used to it. So this is a heroic stand by John Buford. He became famous for this. Eventually, the Confederates pushed the Union ar Army back through the town of Gettysburg and up into some high ground to the south of Gettysburg, where they formed on the high ground in the form of a fish hook and occupied that. And on the second day of battle, Lee ordered Longstreet to attack the south end of that fish hook, where he thought it was unoccupied. He was wrong. The Union Army had hustled some guys up there. It was real rocky ground called the Devil's Den and Little and Big Round Top. And a fellow named Chamberlain, Union officer from Maine, made a heroic stand up on Little Round Top and kept the Confederates from turning the left flank of the Union Army. At the end of the day, Stuart arrives at Gettysburg. He had to fight on a, in a little town up north called Hunterstown to protect that wagon. One of his best brigade commanders, Wade Hampton, was struck in the head with a saber and disabled for the rest of the fight. But he arrives up uh, the afternoon of the second day, and when he reports to General Lee, General Lee gives him his orders for the third day. General Lee is planning what becomes Pickett's Charge. I think you've all heard of that. So the idea is that Stuart is going to ride from in this area where Lee's headquarters is. He's coming in from here, reports to Lee, has him ride up around the Union Army and over here to what's called the Cavalry Field, out east of Gettysburg. And the idea is Pickett is going to smash through with 15,000 men attacking from this area. And Stuart is going to be over here with his cavalry. And this is going to form what we call the hammer, Lee, and the anvil, Stuart. Going to crush the Federal Army in between them. When Stuart gets out there, he fires four cannon shots. North, South, explain exactly what that was about. But historians have speculated that that was a signal to the other side of the field. I mean, we're separated by five, six miles here, at least, OK? But hoping that Lee can hear this and knows that Stuart is in position, and this should be the key to start Pickett's assault. Well, as we all know from history, Pickett never was able to break that line. 
when Stewart got out here, he found that the Federal Cavalry were sitting out here. This was David McMurtry Gregg's men. He was a West Pointer from 1855. He had his brigade out there, or excuse me, division, and he had one brigade from the 3rd Division, Judson Kilpatrick's, and that was Custer. Okay, so he had three brigades out there, and Stuart and the Federal Cavalry fought out there all day, but Stuart was never able to push them out of the way. Pickett never broke the line. So at the end, day, end of the day, after the third day of fighting on the East Cavalry Field, Stuart withdraws after Custer makes a, a great cavalry charge to blunt the Confederates' advance, and that ends the fighting for the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, at the end of the third day of fighting, with all of his ammunition nearly expended, his men, everybody had been fought out, he had a great number of wounded, Robert E. Lee realizes that he has to retreat. And he summons John M. Bowden. He was the man that I talked about earlier that had the independent command. And he gives John M. Bowden the task of escorting the wagon train carrying the wounded back to Virginia. John M. Bowden survived the war. He wrote his memoirs after the war. And he said this was the worst job he ever had. He had a 17-mile wagon train full of men that were wounded, many of them that had not even been attended to medically. They had bled. The blood dried on their jackets. Um, you know, as they dried in the movement of a wagon, that dried blood on a jacket just rubbed on those wounds. And the guys were screaming. They were you know, yelling, please stop. Let me out. Just leave me here to die. The pain was horrific. But John M. Bowden's orders from Robert E. Lee were, do not stop for anything. Keep moving. Because he knew that the Federal Cavalry would be in pursuit. That's the job of cavalry. You know, track down an enemy in retreat. And if he lost his wagons, that would be his transportation system. It put him out of business. So this was a very, very tough job that John M. Bowden had, and this is his route. He left from Gettysburg, they went back to Cashtown, where they came from, crossed the South Mountains, back into the valley, and this area of, called Monterey Pass, and Fairfield, Caledonia Furnace, Green Castle, Cunningham's Crossroads, were all places where the Federal Cavalry either caught up with the wagon train or caught up, or, or Stewart's cavalry intercepted them, and they fought for the purpose of keeping the Federal cavalry away from these trains. They were trying to get back to Williamsport and cross the Potomac River. On the third night, on the third day of battle at Gettysburg, that night the heavens opened up and it literally poured like we never see it pour here in Colorado. Maybe like you saw last week, some of you maybe. But even that wasn't like it pours back there. I've seen it. And that flooded the Potomac River. So when the Confederates actually got to Williamsport, the pontoon bridge that had been built there had been washed away. The river was in flood stage, and they could not cross. So they had to build an encampment that was almost like a semicircle. They dug in. They circled the wagons like you see them do in the Old West. And they fought what they call the Battle of the Mule Skinners. The, the wagon drivers, whatever cavalry was actually in the area, the walking wounded, everybody that could carry a gun got out and fought off the Federal Cavalry until the river finally um, went down far enough that they could cross it. And that took 10 days. So they were stuck north of the Potomac River for 10 days after the Battle of Gettysburg. How are we doing on time, Mike? Uh, doing pretty good. OK, good. I got a little bit more that I think is interesting. So this here is the 3rd Brigade Commander in Pleasant, or 3rd Division Commander in Pleasanton's Corps. And his name is Judson Kilpatrick. The reason Custer, which is in his division, was with David McMurtry Gregg out on the east side of the cavalry field is Judson Kilpatrick ordered his other brigade commander, Elon Farnsworth, 
to attack the Confederates on the south end of the line in this area that I talked about earlier called the Devil's Den. How many of you have ever been to Gettysburg? You know, say some of you know what the Devil's Den looks like, right? Big boulders strewn along. I mean, it's, you know, it's tough to walk through there. Farnsworth protested vehemently. He said, this is not an area for cavalry because it kind of goes into a little box canyon. So once you run in there, the only way out is to come right back out the way you came in. And the Confederates were all hust you know, hunkered down in these rocks and up on the hill on the little round top. And they could shoot down. They could shoot from behind the rocks. Anyway, Judson Kilpatrick ordered Farnsworth to do this. Farnsworth did it. He was killed doing it, and most of his brigade was decimated in this. And for that reason, Kilpatrick became known as Kill Cavalry. And shortly after he was transferred out of the Army of the Potomac, they sent him to the Army of Tennessee, and he was still kind of a screwball. <laughs> now, let's talk about another part of some of these guys. This here is William Grumble Jones. He was a West Pointer from 18, in 1848. He was part of Stuart's command. He had the largest brigade in Stuart's command, and they were from the valley. So these were guys that normally were not in direct contact with, with Stuart. He was their commander, but they were on the other side of the mountains. For the campaign in 1863, they were brought to the Piedmont area. And Stuart and Grumble Jones were in direct contact. Grumble Jones was a fine officer, very strict, letter of the law, known as a good outpost officer. Stuart recognized this, but he, Stuart was kind of a flamboyant guy. He paid attention to business, but in his off time, he liked to have a good time too. You know, he liked singing and dancing. He actually carried a banjo player on his staff. And everywhere he went, he had this banjo player, and they were singing and dancing. And given the fact that Grumble Jones was an 1848 West Pointer and Stuart was an 1854 West Pointer, Grumble Jones was spent around for a while, way before when Stuart was still in diapers, you know. And so he kind of resented that a younger man was his boss, and you know. And and Stuart didn't really like Grumble Jones because kind of had a nasty attitude. He was always in a bad mood, and you know that's why he was called Grumble Jones. So he wasn't his favorite guy, but he knew he was a competent officer. He was in charge of the largest brigade and was, left, was one of the brigades that was left behind to guard the passes in the Blue Ridge Mountains. If you read the orders earlier, it said, leave two brigades behind to guard the passes, and if the Federal Army leaves, your job is to come to the west side of the mountains, bring up all the stragglers, you know, collect them and bring them up to the army, and guard the rear and the right of the army as it moves north. Well, the Federal Army did retire from those passes, but the, the 4,000 men that were left to guard those passes were in command of this name, man named Beverly Robertson. Beverly Robertson had been down in North Carolina the previous year and was raising new cavalry troops and training them. When the summer of 63 came, Lee brought them up for this campaign. He had the smallest brigade in that group. He only had two regiments, which is about 2,000 men. But most of you have been in the military, so you all understand day to rank. If I'm a general today and you're a general of the same grade tomorrow, as long as we're both major generals, I outrank you forever, okay? They were both brigadier generals, but Beverly Robertson's date of rank was before Grumble Jones's, and therefore he commanded this whole group of 4,000 men that was guarding the pass, and Beverly Robertson was I don't know, I think he was kind of a slacker. Stuart didn't particularly like him for several reasons. Most of the Confederates that were in the U.S. Army when the war started, they resigned their commissions and went south. Beverly Robertson stuck around until late into August before he joined the south, so his uh, commitment to the southern cause was somewhat suspect. But more so than that, 
Beverly Robertson was a friend of Jeb Stewart's father-in-law, Philip St. George Cook, who was a Virginian and decided to remain in the Federal Army. And they were friends, so there was some suspicion there. And Beverly Robertson had courted Stewart's wife back before Stewart married her, so there was no love there. And anyway, he was kind of a slacker. These 4,000 men should have been the men that were guarding Lee's right flank and bringing information to him while Stuart was off on that sweep. That didn't happen, and Stuart caught the blame for it. In retrospect, that's Wade Hampton. He's one of the only officers in Stuart's high command that was not a West Pointer. He was one of the richest men in the South before the war. He was one of the largest slaveholders. His grandfather fought with Light Horse Harry Lee in the American Revolution, and his father fought with Andrew Jackson in the War of 1812. But before the war, he had no official military training. He was a planner. He came to the war with what they call Hampton's Legions. He brought six regiments of infantry and three squadrons of cavalry and a battery of artillery which included two Whitworth guns from England. And the unique thing about a Whitworth gun is back in those days when everybody else was shoving the ammunition down the front of the gun, Whitworths were breech loaders. They opened up in the back and you put the ammunition in from the back, made it a lot faster and safer to fire those things. He brought those to the war, came as a colonel in the head of Hampton's legions, was a very competent man, and eventually became a lieutenant general. After Jeb Stuart died, he was promoted to lieutenant general, which was a higher rank than Stuart ever was, and uh, lived to survive the war and went on to become the governor of Virginia after the war. But in retrospect, when I do this as Stuart, I always tell people, you know, I took my best commanders and my best troops, the ones I was used to working with, with me, the guys from the Valley and the guys from North Carolina, I left them to guard the passes under the command of Beverly Robertson. Even though I gave him explicit orders, he didn't follow them. Maybe I should have left Wade Hampton in charge. Things probably would have turned out better. And with that, it's pretty much the end of my presentation. I'd open it up for questions. What are here are just some pictures from over the years of things that we've gotten to do. Is, is, that, is that you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that? Yeah, that's me. Weird. Yeah. I wore that thing for 20 years because, and sometimes it would bug me, you know, but I'd say, man, you know, it took a year to grow it to be big enough. You know, you saw the picture of Stuart earlier. He had a big beard. It took a year to grow that thing to be the, to look like Stuart's. Well, that's and, real? That's your real beard? Oh, yeah, that's me, oh, man. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, I, you know, there were times when I thought about cutting it off, but if I did, I knew that my career as Stuart, you know, next month I need it, and I never get it back. So I wore that thing for 20 years. Um, that's also me. This is a great story. That back there is called the Landon House. In 62, on the Antietam campaign, Stuart took the cavalry out east of the where the Confederate Army was to put a screen, you know, to watch for the Federal Army. And when he got to a place called Urbana, Maryland, he was invited with his staff to a gentleman named Cocky's house for dinner. And Cocky had three lovely daughters and a niece visiting from New York. And after dinner, they all went out for a moonlight stroll. And Stewart saw this big house. It's three stories, two wings, and it was dark and vacant. And Earlier, before the war, it had been a girl's finishing school, and then it closed, and then it became a boy's military academy, and when the war started, all the, the instructors and boys went off and joined the army, so it was vacant. And Stuart looked at it and said, what a grand place to hold a ball. And so he looked at his staff and he said, all right, you clean it up, you get some lighting, you get some refreshments, you invite the guests, I'll get the band, and the next night, they had what became known as the Sabre and Roses Ball at the Landon House in Urbana, Maryland. It's still there. One of my friends knew the guy that owned it. He told him that he knew a guy that did Jeb Stewart, and this guy said, man, I'd love to recreate the Sabre and Roses Ball. 
So we all went, there were about 40 of us, and had the ball. We did the grand march out on the front lawn with the band. And uh, that's General Robert E. Lee, myself, Longstreet, Ewell. There's John Gordon, Isaac Trimble, George Pickett. And there's a bunch of other guys in there. And we had the ball and had a, uh, just a grand old time. Who was that? We did that in, I think it was, let me think, I think it was about 2000, it was for the 150th Antietam. So, so it would have been. Copyright is 2009. Uh, okay. But I think it was late, I think it was later than that, but oh, that's, that's possible. Yeah, that's okay. Recent. 2009, thank you for. That's the, that's I'm really bad at like figuring out when things were. I mean, if you ask me when this was, yeah, a couple of years ago, I find that was 10. <laughs> So, anyway, and uh, that's uh, Jeb Stewart when he was still wearing his federal uniform at First Manassas, the Remembrance Day Parade. That's Stonewall Jackson on the right, Harold von Bork on the left, and Jeb Stewart uh, on the, in the back, and Jeb Stewart on the left, Sport and the Labatt. Custer was a great friend of mine. We used to get together at Gettysburg every year and have a sword, have a sword fight. The, 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 the crowd loved it, Stuart and, and uh, Custer. It never really happened, but the crowd loved it. That was me when I was Stuart at First Manassas. That's the Staunton House, where Robert E. Lee grew up in, uh, in Virginia. That's Stuart, Ewell, and Von Bork. One year they were having a uh, ceremony at the Stonewall Jackson Cemetery in Winchester. I flew in on that Friday and when I got there, everybody was all lined up for the ceremony, and all of a sudden they had started. They said, take a knee, and I was 20 steps from the line. So I took a knee right then and there. I woke up the next morning. My picture was on the front of the Winchester newspaper. Wow. You know, there. I think that's the end. Any questions? Any more questions? Yeah. Farnsworth's action at Devil's Den, when was that? The third day what of the... Um, Midday-ish. I mean, it wasn't real early. I think. During, during yes. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the idea was that you know when Pickett was coming from this way, Kilpatrick had the great idea. All right, you know, I'm gonna send my cavalry in to hit him from the flank. And that didn't work at all because there were already guys from Hood's division that were nestled in the rocks from the fighting of the previous day at Little Round Top, and they got they took a. a Terrible beating on that one. So yes, the idea was as Pickett came. Let's see if we can go back here. Way back. Way back. Yeah, let's go back. Right, right there. As Pickett came from the west. Okay, the Devil's Den area. There's the little round top and stuff. The Devil's Den's right there. So. The Federal Cavalry, Kill Cavalry, ordered Farnsworth to attack up this way, thinking that he would hit Pickett's charge in the flank. But they never got anywhere near. They got to the Devil's Den and got shot to pieces. Farnsworth was killed, and he was a good officer. Bill, could you comment a little bit on the equipment? That yeah, you know, I kind of skipped over the equipment, but I brought some of the stuff the guys would carry. That's a a cavalry saddle, and you know, I thought any of you are welcome to come up and look at it. I also brought some of the uniforms. This is what an enlisted man in the, without the hat, without an enlisted man in the federal cavalry would wear. That's his type of uniform. Generally, they would wear like a plain black slouch hat. The actual uniform was a little thing like this, but the guys, the guys didn't like them. When you're out riding in the sun all day, the top of your ears will get baked right off, you know. So most of them would wear what they call a campaign hat or a slouch hat. And that's what they would wear on, you know, you'll see a lot of the pictures, uh, you know, of the guys. And then there's a couple of Confederate uniforms over there. The one right there is early war. That's from the 1st Virginia Cavalry, which was Jeb Stewart's first cavalry unit when he went up to Harper's Ferry in 1861 and was training the guys. You'll notice that the early Confederate uniforms were very elaborate. Uh, 
Again, you know, make them pretty, the guys will join up. The way things started, when the war first started, everybody thought it was going to last 90 days, that they were going to win, and it would be over. So nobody made a lot of future plans. So a lot of the Confederates came in their own clothes. Well, as time went on and their own clothes wore out and they were a long way from home, the Confederate Army decided, well, we have to clothe these guys. So they came up with what they call the commutation system. And they put out, I've got a list somewhere that says, you know, the first year you get a complete uniform, the second year you get some shirts and socks, the third year you get a new pair of pants, and, you know, and so it was set up. And you didn't really get this stuff. You were given so much in dollars to go to your own private tailor and have a uniform made that conformed to your particular unit to some loose degree. Now, early in the war, a lot of the Confederates that came were militias. In 1859, John Brown attacked Harper's Ferry and tried to form a slave insurrection. That was put down by Robert E. Lee and Jeb Stuart was there at the time, back when they were both still Federal Army officers. But this greatly aroused the Southern people that, hey, you know, they're telling the slaves to rise up and slit our throats. So all kinds of militias formed all over the South, kind of like volunteer fire departments are today. You know, well, you'd have a regular job, but on Tuesday you'd go down to the armory and drill with the guys. It was, a lot of it was social, but you know, there was some military. And, they, they, and the women of the town would design whatever uniform that they wanted for their own militia. And the prettier you made them, the more likely the guys were to join the militia. So in the early war, I mean, there were all kinds of uniforms. A lot of them were very ornate. But as time went on, they couldn't resupply that, so they came up with the commutation system. That didn't work because you might go to your tailor and tell him to make you a uniform, and when your uniform was done, you had marched off to Gettysburg. You know, you were 150 miles away and you were wearing rags. So then the Confederate government decided, well, we're going to have to issue uniforms to the guys, and they came up with what they call the Richmond Depot system, and they had three models, the early uniforms, had piping on the collars that was a different color that matched the branch of service you were in, blue for the infantry, yellow for the cavalry, red for the artillery. And they had, uh, it came along, you know, the edge of, of here. Sometimes they had different colored cuffs. There are no known Richmond Pattern Depot ones known to be in existence. There's no museum that's got an original. We've got pictures of them, so there's tons of reproductions. You know, we know what they looked like. But they were all, by the time the, you know, the war ended, these things were lice infested, they stunk, they were wore out, they were burned. There are, nobody has one, as we know. So then, and the early ones had epaulets on them and belt loops in the back that would help hold up your, your, your belt. They were like these, they were almost like gauze pads that were you know, looped in there. And some of them actually had belt loops. So then, as time went on, you know, the Confederacy had harder and harder time providing uniforms, so they dropped the epaulets and the belt loops and dropped the piping. So they just made, you know, a, a plainer uniform. And then eventually they even made them plainer. They came out with the Richmond Depot pattern three. I have one. Um, and they were just that thing right there, basically, you know. And that one's actually still got some epaulets on it, but, you know, they started using what they called a homespun. Uh, wool that's mostly partially cotton wool blend and stuff and that's why a lot of times you'll hear the confederates referred to as butternuts because they wore butternuts uniforms sometimes people come up and ask me how come you're a confederate you know most of the time i as you can see from the pictures i've played both sides whatever the uh, occasion calls for but i started off uh, when i first went to virginia i ran into a confederate unit that sort of took me in. They were very nice to me. And so every time I went back, I went and found the guys that I met last time and ended up being a Confederate. And I've always told the people, I said, the other reason I sort of enjoyed being a Confederate is wearing these uh, you know, homespun cotton wool mixes that are that color. When you're standing out in the sun, and it's 100 degrees, standing in this dark blue all wool uniform, it gets beastly hot. Those things, Confederates, you could wear any mixture of federal, home, your civilian clothes, stuff the government gave you. I think you saw in that one picture, 
let's see if I can go back to it. Yeah, well, there or even <coughs> there. I mean, look at those guys. They got, you know, every, there's no two guys that have the same uniform on. You know, it's, it's so you, you really had a lot of variety in what you could wear for your own comfort, your own personal taste. When you were in the Federal Army, all of you folks that were in the service, you pretty much know that the government gives you a uniform and they expect you to wear it as they gave it to you. You know, you get very little choice in modifying it to your own personal tastes. Well, Bill, thank you very much for joining us. <laughs> Hopefully we'll get Bill back to some time to look at some other aspect of Yeah, if this. you guys, if there's something you guys want to talk about, uh, I can talk so, about most of the stuff in the Civil War. Let me know what you want to hear about, and I'll, uh, I'll talk about it. Well, we want to give you cool. one of our challenge coins. Cool. Uh, I got a bunch the of these. shows and, all oh, our man, services just, as well. I will treasure so, this. Thank you very much for joining us. Please come up. And like yeah, and feel free. I'll stick around if you've got any questions. You know, if you have greater interest in this yeah. subject, there's two books up here. Uh, one's Plenty of Blame to Go Around. It kind of takes it from the southern side, What you know, what the, before the Gettysburg campaign, Robert E. Lee's army was on an absolute roll. They kicked butt at Fredericksburg in December of 62. They took a vastly smaller army in May of 63 and beat a much bigger federal army at Chancellorsville. By the time the Gettysburg campaign came around, Robert E. Lee thought his army was invincible. And so there was a lot of questions after the war. What went wrong? You know, I mean, we were, we were winning. And so this book talks about, you know, what went wrong. And then there's another book up here that's just the cavalry at Gettysburg. And it talks of it more from both sides, you know, just not so much what this is what might have been, could have been. This is what did happen. And then there's some books up here that got pictures, shows a lot of the different weapons that were carried. And one of my favorite books is a book called Images of the Civil War because there are very few good pictures. You know, they're all black and white like I showed you. But a lot of artists have taken up the idea of painting the story. And one of my favorites, if I can find it. I've always liked more counselors. Yeah, Kunstler stuff is great. Except his characters uh, look a little like the movie characters. Well, you know, and I've always, I've always said that I never liked Kunstler's interpretation of Stuart. And that's, there's the Battle of uh, Gettysburg. But, you know, he's made paintings like these, and there's yeah. tons of these things in here. Another guy named Don Troiani has done it. Yeah. That one picture I showed you of Brandy Station was Don Stevers. So, you know, it's called, there's a whole um, business of military art. Okay, well, thank you very All right. much. Please come and visit us more. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you kept right on time. You did great. Yeah, I figured I had and it. And you covered it all. Yeah, you know, so. I could.